Okay, let's take another crack at the Dread Tracy Harris meme. Yeah, the Dread Tracy Harris meme, the one that makes the Christians tremble. The ones that, re the ones that challenges our faith to its very core, and we shudder to think. How this girl has persecuted us with her idea. No, she's not persecuting us. She just says a meme, floats around the internet, floats around on Twitter. Uh, paraphrasing it, the basic concept is, if I were God, I would stop, I would stop the little kid from dying of cancer. I would stop the little kid from getting raped. A God who, uh, who doesn't do that is not a good God at all. Now, the theologi underlying the theological construct is flawed. Deeply. One of the things that we the theists do, with you the atheists never do, but if you are going to score God cruelty points for our kids with cancer, you know, it's potentially fair. If we're arguing, if we are arguing whether God is benevolent or, or cruel, then fine. We've got to look at the evidence of life itself. So let's score him cruelty points because there are kids who have cancer and they die with their needs unaddressed. And it looks like God is completely and utterly indifferent to their sorrows. Let's score him, let's score him cruelty points for that. Tracy would do better. She wouldn't let that happen. But here's the underlying assumption that we the theists make, and it's more logical. Yeah, sometimes we're more logical than you. Yeah, sometimes we are. Sometimes we are. We're more logical in this particular instance because we are inferring theologic, our theological understanding of God. If we're going to score him cruelty points for giving the kid cancer, we, the theists, are also going to score him glory points for what? For everything else. <laughs> Every single solitary other thing called life. If I'm going to score God cruelty points for the sorrow I see on TV, then i got to score him glory points, goodness and glory points, for every other thing that happens in this world that is both good and benevolent and wonderful and nice. My beautiful wife. My beautiful cat. It's not just about feeling grateful to God for giving me all these good, goody goods. Yeah, beautiful wife, I have a beautiful cat. You may find yourself in a beautiful house with a beautiful wife. And a beautiful cat. <laughs> no, I don't think that's part of the song. You may ask yourself, well, how did I get here? So I am, theologically, I'm not talking about, you know, hallelujah, praise God, I'm so grateful, glory, glory, glory to his name, holy, holy. You can do that, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking theologically. Stacking the decks. Now, I tried to explain this to other atheists, and they, you know, as, as they are wont to do in conversations that involve God, you know, They'll falsify the, they'll, they'll start you know, ginning up the arguments on their side. If we're keeping score in life, and, and we are blaming God and ascribing to God that there is probably something cruel about the fact that he looks, he doesn't care if kids die of cancer, or at least he allows it to happen. And we the theists need to acknowledge that. Because if we're saying God is omnipotent, no, sweetheart, please, please. I, I'm, I'm lecturing. I'm, I'm trying to make a video here. Yeah, yeah. The sweetest, say the sweetest little thing on earth. You're the sweetest little thing that ever lived. Sweetest little thing that ever lived. Tell them all about God. Tell them about God, sweetheart. You tell me all about God. You tell me all about God. All right, sweetheart. Good girl. See that? The benevolence of God cannot, cannot be quantified. It's infinite. Just the benevolence of the things in your own life. If we're going to score God cruelty points for kids with cancer, we've got to score him glory points and goodness and glory points for everything else that exists in the world. For all things that life involves. And then the, the, the goodness of God starts far outweighing the bad. I mean, if you have faith in life at all. And most atheists have faith in life. And when you start asking them to, you know, what, 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 what gives you value in life, they start, you know coming to the same conclusions about what constitutes the good in their life as we the Christians. But they're just not giving him the credit. Now I'm not saying if you don't, if you haven't, you don't understand him in your heart to be God, I'm not saying giving him the credit like, you know, hallelujah, praise you, here's my beautiful wife. I'm talking about a theological argument where you give him the credit. Because you're ginning up the cruelty aspects of life while disregarding the positive. 
hence you are falsifying the terms with which you have decided that a God that God can't be omnibenevolent. In fact, he can be omnibenevolent. There are there are tons of valid explanations for as why as to why a good God would allow some. Did you hear the key word? Some. Key word. Some suffering in life. Maybe a lot, but it's still some finite amount. The God that we are positing exists. The God that we are theorizing is real. As real as my right arm, I have sometimes said. Yes, he has allowed some suffering in this world. Some sickness in this world. Some sorrow and anguish in this world. But the God that we are theorizing exists is trying to lead us in a world that lasts forever. Life everlasting, where there is not coincidentally no sorrow, no sickness, and no death. And all you experience is omnibenevolence. So, that's just one little bit of the point. There's more to say on the subject, but that's enough for now. Okay, bye-bye.